Let's start. We already started informally. Now the formal start of the event, trial with and without mathematics, the 2014 Stanford Symposium on Law and Rationality, and we take different perspectives, legal, philosophical, and computational. Marcello and I have been preparing this, uh, this event for about half a year now. We have been looking forward to this very much. Thank you all for coming here, speakers, commentators, and guests. I know I'm a visitor only here at Stanford, and it is not a burden to go to Stanford and the weather and the, uh, the university and the, and the smart minds here. But still, thank you for being here. Uh, the preparations for this event started more or less half a year ago. We are speaking here about the possibilities and the limitations of mathematics for, and formal modeling in, uh, in the law and in trial situations. And Marcello and I are, in, in a sense, our corporation is in a sense an example of the application of statistics and logic because it started as an accident. So uh, I came here doing my artificial intelligence and law research at the Codex Center for Legal Informatics and I was having a good time, but my current focus is really on thinking about statistics in the legal setting, in the forensic science setting. And I had not really met someone here at Stanford that was also interested in it. And, and then a friend of mine, an old friend, and Gartner, she saw a poster. A poster at law school, and it said, there is a class on law and probability, and it is taught by Marcello Di Bello. I had never heard of him, I must admit. But so, it started with a poster. And we met, and that was the statistical side, the accident that started it all. And then we started speaking, and we had shared interests. We clearly shared interests. Uh, we both have a passion for the interdisciplinary study of the connections between law and formal modeling, and then in particular statistics and logic. And then it became easy. It became, let's, let's say, a necessity for us, like in logic, to cooperate and develop something, an event. And it worked out very nicely. We are very happy for uh, having this lineup. Uh, and I hope that also you all will enjoy that. Of course, this event uh, uh, could not have been here if we were not supported. So let me also mention the sponsors that we have. Uh, uh, first, the Codex Center for Legal Informatics. That is my host during this sabbatical year where I'm a fellow. Then uh, the Stanford University Philosophy Department, which, which from several sources has contributed to, uh, the, to this event. The Dutch organization, the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, NWO, has also supported this event through the project that I'm working in. There is the Patrick Subs Center for History and Philosophy of Science, Division of Logic, Methodology, and Philosophy of Science. And uh, at a late stage, we are very happy that Ted Zickelman also started to contribute with his nicely titled Center for Computation, Mathematics, and the Law at the University of San Diego. He's also organizing an interesting event for this audience, perhaps in uh, June next year, on artificial intelligence law. Let me see what I still have to say. Oh yeah, it started with a poster, and for me, this event has become uh, nicknamed as the Red Poster Event. We, a friend of Marcello has uh, uh, designed the poster that you, many of you have seen. So it started with a poster, and, uh, and it became a poster, and now it is the real thing. I hope that you will have a good day. I, I'm sure I will. I see very bright and interesting minds here. And uh, um, let's go to the formal program. That is our first speaker. Our first speaker is Z Sandy Isabel. I had not met him before, but I'm very happy to have him here. He's a, a professor of statistics and mathematics, so, uh, but he has been applying and thinking about statistics and mathematics in the legal area, especially in the evidential area, for a long time. And what we did not know before, but, that we, that, that, but what we, Marcello and I, are very happy with, he is giving us the historical perspective also. So for his, my field, my main field is these days, artificial intelligence as applied to the law. Let's say that artificial intelligence is something like 50, 60, something like that years old. The law is 2,000 years old or something like that or older. Philosophy is 2,000 years old or something like this. And the connections between law and philosophy and statistics, they have been thought about at least for some 100 or 200 years. And Sandy will tell us something about that. 
He has a PhD in Harvard. He has also been thinking about the, the, the deep issues for a long time, for instance, in his work on the revision of the reference manual of scientific evidence. I'm not sure whether he's going to tell us something about it, but that is really about the applicability and use of, of, of real science in a legal setting. And I'm very happy to give him the floor. Sandy, please come over. Cup, so this will be like Mario Rubio, but. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a uh, pleasure to be here and an honor to have been invited. Uh, it's always sort of a, an interesting challenge to give a, a first talk and also a talk um, on a diverse subject such as this. Uh, so uh, the title of my talk is Tribe of Skeptics, Probability and the Law of Evidence. Um, here's an outline of what I'll be talking about, uh, not equally distributed among these, uh, but I'll start out uh, by very briefly, thank you, um, talking a little bit about uh, the French School of Probability Theory. Thank you. Uh, the school and others who were influenced by them used probability to analyze uh, questions such as testimony, evidence and juries. The uh, slightly novel aspect of this talk is that some 19th century English evidence texts discussed uh, this, and I'll talk a little bit about that, although I'd go into more detail, obviously, in a published version, but uh, there are some interesting aspects. Uh, and uh, one of the arguments I'll be making is that uh, when you look at some of these arguments, uh, they're quite similar to many of the kinds of discussions that one has nowadays. So, sorry? Okay. So, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Uh, and then I will, um, and that I will uh, be largely non-controversial and descriptive, but then I'll switch to a case study at the very end, fingerprints versus DNA, and discuss a few of the issues that have been advanced in the context of that particular uh, discussion. So onward to the first slide, some prehistory. Uh, so probability is typically, mathematical probability is typically uh, dates back, dated back to 1654, which was uh, when there was a celebrated correspondence between Pascal and Fermat, where they discussed analyzing various kinds of games of chance. But even though games of chance were the initial um, motivation for thinking about these things. Nevertheless, from almost the beginning, people started thinking about wider issues of applying probability to other areas. Uh, one of them was to annuities, but another was to this question of the law. And so there's a youthful paper by Leibniz in 1665 where he talks about, I mean, so Leibniz had been in Paris. He knew about the, this correspondence. He knew Huygens, who wrote the first uh, published book on probability theory, and so Leibniz has this youthful paper where he talks about, at least on the theoretical level, being able to understand uh, proof in terms of probabilistic terms. Would it be possible to do that kind of thing? Uh, a more significant contribution is uh, 1685, James Bernoulli, a member of the celebrated family who wrote a book, The uh, Ars Conjectandi. Now, back then, uh, they lived in sort of uh, happier times, and so uh, instead of having perish or publish, uh, they seem to have perish and then publish, because uh, this book was written in 1685, but Bernoulli was so concerned about it uh, that he sat on it until he died uh, in the early 1700s, and it was only published actually in 1713. But there's a celebrated section in it where he talks about the idea that you can mathematize or quantify uh, the various aspects of the proof, proof process. A uh, final sort of uh, precursor is uh, 1699. There's a well-known paper by John Craig, which had to do with uh, testimony and witnesses. And the idea in particular uh, that, like as in the game of telephone, that if A talks to B, who talks to C, and so on, somehow the reliability diminisheth as time goes on, and therefore, 
in particular, what would be, say, the evidence for the resurrection, et cetera, because some 1,700 years separate us uh, from then, and we have the succession of uh, testimonies, but don't, doesn't it diminish with time? Uh, we have this, there's this uh, famous expression you know, from the Hebrews, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Uh, and so the idea, presumably, of cloud of witnesses is there are so many witnesses that even if one of them isn't particularly compelling, yet as a group, when we take them together, they should be compelling. And so these arguments actually uh, were a considerable element of uh, discussion during the 18th century. Uh, David Hume wrote a celebrated essay on miracles and so on, uh, the idea being what, you know, how strong was the evidence. Now, uh, a somewhat uh, different turn uh, took place uh, due to the French School of Probability Theory, and so I'm listing three names here. So one is uh, Condorcet, who wrote uh, a book, a number of things, but a book on the application of the analysis of probability to decisions rendered by a plurality of votes. And so he was one of the philosophes, you know, French rationalism, and the idea being that we have, you know, let's try to analyze jury systems. So this is a work actually that people have discussed, you know, have discussed in recent decades in terms of the United States jury system. But the idea being that if we have people vote, are we better off with, say, a majority, with uh, an absolute 10-0, or could we have uh, 11 out of 12? You know, those kinds of issues. Uh, do you need uh, un unanimity? If not, uh, what would be the impact, and what would be the impact on size? And so this was a book that he had written. Uh, Condorcet uh, perished during the revolution, uh, but he had a younger contemporary, uh, Pierre Simon, the Marquis de Laplace, uh, who started being active in the 1770s, but was uh, politically much more agile than Condorcet and survived the revolution. Uh, and so he wrote a celebrated book called The Théorie Analytique des Probabilités in 1812. Uh, and uh, the importance of this book cannot be overstated. This really dominated mathematical probability for over a century. This was really the, and the reason being that uh, Laplace simultaneously brought tremendous mathematical power, tremendous mathematical power. But there are many serious applications, data analysis and so on in his book, and also he had a conceptual uh, unity that he brought to it. And so this became really the dominant view. Now as the century wore on, there were critics and so on, who I will briefly mention later, but this is the established position that is being criticized. He had a, a still younger contemporary uh, Poisson, who um, from your undergraduate courses in math or physics and so on, you may have come across as so a very uh, prolific mathematician. But towards the end of his career, he wrote a book, uh, Researches on the Probability of Judgments in Criminal and Civil Matters. Uh, but the title is actually a slight misnomer because it too is a treatise on probability theory, although one of the things that he was prominently interested in was the application of probability uh, in uh, the process of uh, judgment. And so all of these people discuss, well certainly Laplace and Poisson discuss both evidence, how different pieces of evidence might be, you might mathematically analyze how they combine together. They discuss testimony, witnesses both in series and parallel, uh, and finally uh, judgments in terms of you know, how you constitute courts and so on and do modeling. There was a series of papers in the Oh, 1970s that uh, did analyses of American courts in terms of jury uh, setups and so on, but they start by looking back at these earlier papers. It's always nice to put faces to names. So this is the uh, Marquis de Laplace on the left and uh, the front page of his uh, book, The Théorie de Analytique des Probabilités. Uh, if you look at, you won't find this picture on the internet uh, but it's probably the most authentic one we have. A colleague of mine recently managed to acquire it from a French art dealer. And so this was painted around 1784 by a, a prominent court painter. And so this is presumably what Laplace actually looked like. Now his Théorie Analytique was published in 1812, but uh, if anything, an even more important publication was uh, two years later, he wrote an introduction 
There were several editions that this went through. And two years later, he wrote an introduction, uh, which was then separately published, called the uh, Philosophical Essay. And so this was one of the first, what you might call, um, popular science books. So it's a very interesting book to read because there's not a, a single formula in the entire book, right? Because people have math fear, and if I have formulas, they'll say, oh, I, I can't read this. So the entire uh, book was written, although sometimes there's very hard mathematics that's being described. But uh, this did, as a result, was a book that people would read. And so this was a quite influential book. And one other, here's uh, Poisson. And so the, on the left with a copy of his book, uh, the priciest book in my own personal library. I was very delighted at some point to get a, a, a nice clean copy uh, some time ago. But a very interesting book because it's both from the mathematical perspective, but it also talks at great length about these uh, issues. OK, so that's, uh, if you like, the uh, first part of my talk. Uh, Dramatis Personae. Now, meanwhile, in England, um, after uh, Laplace uh, wrote his um, Theorie Analytique, and in particular the philosophical essay, uh, a number of uh, English uh, jurists uh, started uh, writing about uh, some of these issues uh, in their uh, treatises on evidence. So I'm going to talk about this quite briefly, but the argument would be that uh, these are interesting uh, discussions that we should look at. And if there's a written version, I'll try to flesh this out more. But I'd want to at least give you some flavor of who some of these personalities are and the kinds of things that they said. Uh, so you've probably heard of the first name, Jeremy Bentham, but the, a number of other people who are a little less well known, Starkey, Wills, uh, and Best. So what about Bentham? Well. Uh, towards the end of his career, Bentham uh, wrote a book called The Rationale of uh, Judicial Evidence, published in 1827. And uh, it's an interesting book in general. It was an uh, important uh, treatise on uh, evidence at the time. But the uh, first volume, chapter six, is the one that's of particular interest to us, Degrees of Persuasion and Probative Force, How Measured. And Bentham was uh, very critical of the language, the qualitative language that was used uh, at that time. So he says it's most deplorably defective. And then he proposed instead quanti quantifying uh, positive and negative degrees of persuasion. And he likened it to using a decigrade scale like a thermometer. So the idea is that your degree of belief, so when a, a, someone testifies, so uh, you you're going to a conference in Stanford next week? Yes. And what's your assurance of, of that? Well, on a scale of minus 10 to plus 10, I'll say it's 9. I don't know, maybe something will happen in, in between. 9 seems a little low, so Bentham also said you could also use a centigrade in scale instead. You could go from minus 100 to plus 100. But the idea is instead of asserting a fact 100%, uh, the idea was the witness would recognize that there were certain limitations to what they knew. For example, in eyewitness identification, it's easy to uh, imagine that someone would say, yes, I thought that that was the person, but we've probably all experienced this thing where we see someone who looks very similar to someone uh, um, you know, but it turns out not to be the same person. The girl was visiting Berkeley a member of the faculty leaned over and seemed to think that I was the chairman who had been on leave for the preceding year. And he said, Peter? <laughs> so, and this was, this was his chairman, so he knew this person quite well, but apparently we had a, a fairly substantial physical resemblance. So uh, he would presumably have said, well, I'm 90% sure, or, or not percent, but this would be, this is a scale from minus to plus. Or even, uh, he even said you could go have gradations of minus 1,000 to plus 1,000. And his thought was, uh, but he was qualified. He said that he thought the use would gradually increase over time, but would always be infrequent. So his idea was not that this should be an invariable uh, thing that should be used, but that sometimes when someone recognized that there was some substantial uncertainty, they would actually try to quantify uh, what that, the nature of that uncertainty was. There were, of course, critics, um, one of them, and so it's you know, interesting. In fact, most people were critical. 
uh, Etienne Dumont, who was Bentham's French translator, uh, discusses uh, this uh, idea at one point, and he makes a number of points. One of them, and as I said, it's interesting that these arguments really uh, prefigure later arguments. Uh, so one of them is that legal probabilities cannot be mathematically quantified. Okay, you just can't do that. There's no sense in which you can uh, assign a number. A second argument is that witnesses will assign different numbers. So that, in other words, there's sort of no common scale. And why is my eight the same as your nine? And finally, that there would be misuse uh, by the ignorant. Uh, the late Amos Tversky, who used to be in the psychology the department, uh, he, both he and Dan, Danny Kahneman did wonderful work on assessing how people actually do probability assessments. And one of the things they found is you know, there are certain kinds of typical patterns of misassignment. And one is often that people will be more certain about something that, than they should be. Uh, and so misuse by the ignorance. Uh, and so Dumas said, these different states of belief, which it is difficult to express in numbers, display themselves to the eye, uh, eyes of the judge by other signs. So I don't need to know. I, it, rather than you telling me you're 90% sure, as the judge, I will see that you sort of hesitate, you rub your chin or whatever, and I can tell, therefore, that you're not as certain as you sound, and that that's the more, in other words, that we as, uh, as members of the, the, uh, the jury or the judge have ways of uh, more accurately assessing uh, the reliability of a witness than the witness themselves. Now, uh, for me, hopefully, the, one of the things is I'm hoping this conference will be a, a, a learning experience. I know it'll be a learning experience. Uh, so I just will throw out something that I'm uh, sort of recently became uh, interest, interested in uh, because of a completely separate um, topic I'm dealing with uh, are one and two. I'm interested in, for totally different reasons, an obscure um, person called uh, Johannes von Kries. Uh, but who's actually quite well known in the psychological literature. He was a 19th century German uh, physiological uh, psychologist. And he wrote a book on the foundations of probability in which he is, says probability is good, but it has a very uh, clear ambit in which it can be applied, and you shouldn't misapply it outside that. And uh, his arguments, uh, as I've now realized, uh, sort of stem to the fact that earlier he'd written a much, uh, a, a very influential paper in which he had attacked Fechner's psychophysics. So in psychophysics, the idea is we can numerically quantify sensation. And von Kries said, well, you know, that's, I just don't think that, that if you think about it, it's possible. And one of his arguments was there's no common scale. How can you and I talk about whether our sensation of pain is comparable? They're just not, comp they're, they're not comparable. I have an internal subjective sensation of pain. You have an internal subjective sensation of pain. Uh, maybe I can qualitatively order my sensations. You can qualitatively order yours. But you know, how do we put those on some kind of common uh, uh, ground? And so the, the skepticism, therefore, carried over to probability, because thanks to Laplace, probability was a subjective quantity. It reflects, in part, our ignorance, according to Laplace, and in part, our knowledge. And so uh, von Kries accepted that probability was basically a subjective assessment, uh, but the idea was you can't measure it typically for him. He believed in qualitative rather than quantitative probabilities. So, there's this, so I guess what I'm saying is that the skepticism within the legal literature about whether you can quantify probabilities, there's actually this vast hinterland of other people, it seems to me, in the psychological literature, which it would be interesting to discuss and study where uh, people are more generally expressing skepticism about the extent to which internal states of mind can be uh, quantified, or what does it mean to quantify them. Uh, another person I'll mention is uh, William Wills, who wrote a, an essay on the rationale of circumstantial evidence. Uh, just to give you a flavor of the uh, criticism of Bentham, he says, a learned writer, Bentham, whose opinions, in despite of his numerous eccentricities, of matter and style have exercised great influence in awakening the spirit of judicial reformation asks, does justice require less precision than chemistry? The truth is that the precision attainable in the one case is of a nature which the other does not admit. Now notice here that there's not, a, uh, there's not the von Kries idea that things aren't comparable. It's a question of whether uh, you can admit of a certain degree of, of uh, precision. 
right? So it's not somehow the, the um, sort of which type or which category, but it's a question of whether or not uh, you can even be that precise. Now, just to be a little provocative, although this part of the talk is supposed to be not controversial in the sense I will raise questions rather than give answers, uh, but there's this well-known case, uh, U.S. v. Fatico, that some of you, who, well, I'm just curious, who has heard of the Fatico case? case. Maybe you can raise your hand. Okay, great. So this is a wonderful case. You can look it up online. Uh, Jack Weinstein, who's a federal district judge in New York, uh, has some uh, case in which um, someone was convicted uh, and of, a, I, I think, hijacking a truck or whatever. And so at the sentencing hearing, the question was, issue was whether he was a member of organized crime. And uh, the state's attempt to argue that was ruled inadmissible uh, because uh, it wasn't a stat, or it was not admissible. Einstein said, I'm not going to take that into account because it hasn't been established beyond reasonable doubt. And he got overturned. And judges don't like being overturned. He was told that it was the wrong standard. So what uh, Weinstein did was there's apparently a monthly meeting of the various judges in that district. And so he went to them, and they, you had these four verbal standards. One is preponderance, clear and convincing, clear, unequivocal, and convincing, beyond reasonable doubt. And my memory is that uh, Judge Weinstein thought that, you know, the four standards I had to put into play, it's one of these. I've been told it's not beyond reasonable doubt, so I have to sort of figure out, you know, which one it is, and, but also, what does that mean? So what he did was he went to his fellow justices and asked them to put numbers, not per Bentham from minus to plus, but, you know, probabilities. And what I love about this table is it's just all over the map. Now, basically, everybody sort of agrees on uh, preponderance, right? Everybody's 50 plus or 51 plus. But then if you look at it, everything else is, is sort of, so one judge just says, sorry, once you go beyond preponderance, you can't estimate it numerically. Another judge is willing to say that beyond reasonable doubt is 90%, but that these two middle standards are, he says it's elusive and unhelpful. Uh, there is a judge for whom beyond reasonable doubt is 76%. Uh, there are, um, you know, and you can see that it's just all, in fact, over here's judge number nine, clear, convincing, unequivocal, and convincing is actually higher than beyond reasonable doubt, whereas for the rest, mostly, you know, put those in between, with obviously the third being somewhat stronger than the second. Uh, but what you certainly sort of take away from this table, and I think what Judge Weinstein was probably trying to communicate, is that these verbal standards weren't very helpful to him in terms of what he was actually supposed, you know, what, how strong was the evidence, right? He had to make a decision, and he has to, first of all, decide which standard is appropriate, but then how do you actually apply it to the case? Maybe Ron Allen will have something to say about this. Hey. Um, so, but as I said, though, I'm not adopting a position on that, and no one, but I'm, it is an interesting issue as to, and that will be one of the themes of my talk, is that although it's sort of clear what the, some of the drawbacks are to quantifying certain kinds of uh, states of belief and so on, uh, it's not as exactly as if the alternatives are, are completely uh, pellucid as well. Okay, now a second person uh, in my little uh, uh, group, uh, Thomas Starkey. Uh, he was uh, St. John's College, Cambridge. He was senior wrangler in Smith's Prize, the top prizes in mathematics. So he was a person of some ability, downing professor of law, Royal Commission on the English Criminal Code, practical treatise on the law of evidence, which was one of the better known ones. And uh, so he has an example. He says, let it suppose that A is robbed and the contents of his purse, so it's a little bit like Collins, per contents of his purse were one penny, two sixpences, three shillings, four half crowns, five crowns, six half sovereigns, and seven sovereigns, and a person apprehended in the same fair or market where the robbery takes place is found in possession of the same remarkable combination of coin and of no other. But no other, no other part of the coin can be identified. No circumstances operate against the prisoner except his possession of the same combination of coin. So the question is, well, how compelling is that? And Starkey says, notwithstanding the very extraordinary coincidences as to the number of each individual kind of coin, although the circumstances raise a high probability of identity. He's not saying necessarily numerical, yet it's still one of an indefinite and inconclusive nature. 
On the other hand, evidence of a conclusive nature and tendency is restricted by no limits of mere probability. Now he says, in some instances, however, mere mechanical co coincidences uh, are of this description. So in the ordinary case where cloth is cut and stolen from a loom, the perfect coincidence between cloth found in the possession of the prisoner and the remnant left behind is of this description. The probability of identity arising from the perfect coincidence of the severed threads exceeds the bound of arithmetical calculation and deprives the mind of all power of attributing such a series of coincidences to mere accident. So he has this interesting, you know, if you can calculate it, bad, but if you can't calculate it, then it can be convincing. He says, it's of no moment exact expression cannot be given to the inferior degrees of belief. The doctrine of chances and nice calculations of probability cannot be applied to human actions. Again, this is an interesting 19th century debate. Uh, medical doctors, medical statistics are useless. I have my patient, his personal circumstances, the overall medical statistics aren't informative. They cannot be applied to human actions which are essentially unlike and dependent upon peculiarities of persons and circumstances which render it impossible to assign to them a precise value or to compare them with a common numerical standard. Now, what I'm going to do in the final uh, part of the talk is uh, go all the way to the 20th century, 21st century really, and have a case study, uh, the Mayfield affair. How many people have heard of the Mayfield case? Again, okay, so maybe 50%. Uh, so March 11, 2004, a terrorist bomb attack in the Madrid train station. It resulted in 191 deaths. This was a quite serious uh, event, 2,000 people injured. The Spanish authorities found a bag of detonators near the site of the explosion with a fingerprint on it, not matching any in their data bank. But, uh, so it got sent out to Interpol, and so the FBI searched its fingerprint database, and they located a possible match in the prints of Mr. Brendan Mayfield an attorney in Portland, Oregon. Uh, the FBI examiners concluded that the print was a, their words, in an affidavit to the court, a 100% positive identification. And on the basis of this uh, affidavit, uh, Mr. Mayfield was uh, arrested on a material witness warrant. Uh, here's a picture on the left, right is uh, Mr. Mayfield's uh, rolled or inked print. On the left is the print from uh, the Madrid bombing. Now this is the kind of thing when you know, we, we look at it in court, we think, thank goodness, an expert is uh, looking at this because a lay person like you or me could never you know, decide that these are actually coming from the same person. But fortunately, we have the fingerprint experts who look at this and tell us that a little bit like Starkey's uh, exemplar, although you require some expert knowledge there, uh, these are the same. Uh, but there's an important difference between these two. Does anybody know what that difference is? The answer is $2 million. And that's because uh, the Spanish disagreed. You know, so before Mr. Mayfield was even arrested, the Spanish National Police were notified. And uh, they looked at Mr. Mayfield's print and they said, well, we don't think this is a match. And they tell him, we think it's conclusively negative. Uh, now, there are these points of agreement. The Spanish thought that there were only seven. Uh, the uh, FBI. Uh, thought there were 15. So the FBI flew a team out to Madrid on April 21st to have a sit down and discuss it. And at the end of the day, they agreed to disagree. And on May 6th, Mr. Mayfield was arrested on a material witness warrant. Fortunately for Mr. Mayfield, however, the Spanish, since they weren't persuaded, continued to look. And they shortly after told the, uh, maybe within two weeks, they told the FBI, we've actually matched the print uh, to an Algerian Juan A. Daoud and Mr. Mayfield was then soon freed and later settled with the United States for $2 million uh, in a, I guess, unlawful arrest suit. So um, this is, and now this case has had some impact in, uh, for uh, the fingerprint community because, you know, it's not the first misidentification, but there are various things you can say, you know, that were announced in the past. You had an incompetent analyst. Well, in this particular case, it was not only an FBI analyst, but the section chief signed on. The FBI brought someone out uh, of uh, retirement who, who agreed. Uh, and there was even a defense uh, uh, expert who was hired and said, yeah, they're the same. Uh, you can say incompetent labs was another, uh, well, that wouldn't apply here, and so on. You can go down a, a sort of checklist of 
of um, analyses of what you know lessons learned in uh, earlier uh, fingerprint misidentifications. My own personal uh, view of this is uh, Mr. Mayfield was picked out because they did a search of 50 million uh, fingerprints, and there's a big difference between being a police, you know, the police in some mid-level town where you might have 10,000 prints on file, and you also think you have some idea of who the, the criminal is, versus something where you're searching 50 million prints, and you really don't have a clear sense of uh, how close something can be. So in the last four minutes, um, well, what's involved in this process? You know, how, well, uh, if you think about it, and what an examiner uh, identifies uh, that uh, you suggests the latent and roll prints could have a common source. Uh, you, now, the idea is prints will never be the same, right? Uh, you know, if you just take the same person's roll print twice, the pixels on the image are going to be different. Uh, but the idea is part of the expertise of being a fingerprint examiner is knowing how much distortion can happen. Plus, of course, latents are typically only partial. And so the idea is whatever differences we see are consistent. And then finally, the examiner asserts that only one person in the world could be the source of the latent print, or at least post Mayfield, the profession is starting to modify, but that has certainly been the traditional stance, right? You either have an, a positive inclusion, 100%, only person, positive exclusion, definitely not this person, or inconclusive, and there's nothing in between. Until recently, it was actually a professional uh, misconduct to make some kind of probabilistic statement and say, well, I'm 99% sure this comes from that individual. The International uh, Association for Identification said you couldn't do that. So I'm going to contrast this with uh, DNA, a subject close to my heart that a couple of other speakers will be mentioning. Uh, if you contrast this, so the processes in DNA identification and fingerprints are uh, have similarities. DNA is unique, fingerprints are unique. Uh, these both may be true, but they're irrelevant because you only examine part of the DNA genome and the latent is typically only a partial print. And so the question is not theoretically whether something is uniquely identifying, but given the information available, is it, right? It's one thing to say that the human face is uniquely identifying in the sense that if I could get up close and take photographs from every angle with arbitrary precision, it's another saying, thing to say, if, can the little old lady with uh, glasses uh, across the street at twilight accurately identify someone she doesn't know, right? That's, they're just two different propositions. So in DNA, uh, 13 loci, 15 are examined, whereas fingerprints, they have friction-rich detail. But the difference is in DNA, there's a statistical calculation, whereas in fingerprints, it's a 100% subjective uh, Judgment. It's a little bit like Starkey in the sense that he's saying you look at it and it's just compelling to me as the examiner. Okay, as soon as I would do a calculation, so it'd be interesting to see what Starkey would have to say about uh, DNA. And finally, just so that DNA doesn't seem like a complete black box, although, you know, I've been brainwashed, so I've been living with it for many years. But for people who don't know, basically the typical kind of system nowadays, the idea is you measure lengths. So the way this is an electropharogram, the way you would interpret this is how far along you are says how, how the length. And so you hear you have two fragments, one of which is detectively longer than the other by some quantified amount. The heights are a little less relevant for this purpose. They're basically just telling you how much DNA is present. And so the idea is you can look at this and read off and say, oh, you have two alleles of one kind, and here another two alleles. This is a different locus, two alleles two alleles, and over here, two, two, and two. Here you have two, two, and here you have actually one. It's the so-called homozygote. It's, you know, it's the same thing. And you can actually then make a list. So there's software which will convert. Actually, there's electronic data which was used to create this electropharogram, but there's also software that can convert this into numbers. And here's a typical profile. So if you're using the 13 locus system, the names of the loci or locations aren't so important. But here's the first one, D3S1358. And it might be that your profile is your 16, 18. So at this particular location, you have you know, two copies of the chromosome, uh, three, one from your father, one from your mother. And in one, you have some segment that's repeated 16 times. And the other, you have a segment that's repeated 18 times. What they are, how you, you know, all that sort of, the bottom line is those two numbers, OK? And what I'm just saying is this previous diagram tells you where those numbers come from. You do some complicated 
process involving extracting the DNA, amplifying it, running it through capillary electrophoresis. But at the end of the day, you have electronic data, which can be converted in non-problematic cases. And yes, there are always complicated situations because the lab never completely controls what comes in the front door. But you get this kind of profile. And so this brings me to, I believe, my last file, which is you can say, well, you know, what's the big deal? You just have these 13 pairs of numbers. You know, why? But we know on CSI and things like that, that you know, DNA really nails it. How can this be so uh, definitive? Well, you know, you have to do data studies to decide how unusual 16, 18 profile is. But order of magnitude, order of magnitude, very roughly speaking, typically something like this will be, have a chance of about one in 100 of occurring. Okay, about one in 100 times, order of magnitude, you might expect to see someone, uh, say, that's one in 10, okay, just to be conservative. Order of magnitude, one in 10 times, uh, you might have something like this. And also, these loci are chosen to be uh, approximately independent, which means that you can multiply the probabilities. And so even though each one of them is only one in 10, since you have 13 of them, Okay, you get what defense attorneys sometimes refer to as one in a gazillion because the joint frequency of a nine locus, forget about 13, but nine locus profile is one tenth to the ninth or about one in a billion. And so this is the um, scientific basis for a DNA identification. And the point is even looking at a relatively small number of locations, you have a very strong kind of uh, evidence. And this has had an enormous impact on forensic science because much of forensic science remains subjective, if you like, in starking mode. So bite marks, hair and fiber analysis, blood spatter, they typically involve subjective um, analyses. And the advent of forensic DNA identification is, may in fact, is changing this. There was a 2009 NRC report that was highly critical of the current state of forensic science. First of all, DNA acts as a new gold standard. If it's DNA versus uh, fingerprints, DNA wins, okay? Number two, it's raised the bar. So there's something that prosecutors refer to woefully as the CSI effect, which is you might have a rape case and the woman says, well, he raped me. And then the jury says, yeah, but where's that DNA, right? We know witness identification is, can be unreliable and stuff like that, maybe this person has. We want to have that hard science and sometimes the DNA isn't available and it creates problems for prosecutors because there's an expectation now among uh, the layperson uh, that you will have scientific evidence and not purely subjective evaluations. And uh, in particular, the 2009 NRC report, because of its criticisms, are leading to various kinds of reforms in the forensic science community. And so forensic science really has been rapidly changing over the last couple of decades, and I would argue that a primary reason for this is the uh, contrasting case of uh, DNA. It's sort of, it's a gold standard to which all others uh, aspire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy Isabel. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Andrea Roth. She will comment and offer some remarks, hopefully very polemical. Uh, um, so Andrea Roth is uh, assistant professor of law at the um, University of California at Berkeley. And her research is concerned with rethinking certain uh, pedigreed concept in uh, criminal law in light of the widespread use of scientific proof and quantitative evidence um, she's also concerned with the viability of the jury trial, given the widespread uh, use of scientific evidence. And, well, one article I should mention is safety in numbers. When is DNA evidence alone enough to convict? Published by um, New York uh, University Law Review in 2010. Uh, please join me in welcoming Andrea Roth. Thanks. First, I want to echo um, Sandy's thanks to Bart and Marcello for putting this on and the Codex Center and Department of Philosophy for, for inviting me. Um, and to Sandy for a fascinating and long overdue look about how new evidence scholarship isn't so new after all. Um, it's also a rare treat to talk about Pierre Laplace. 
even though I'm a, a law professor, not a mathematician, uh, Laplace has a special place in my heart as a former public defender for three reasons. Uh, first, he went into a career that his father disapproved of. He wanted him to be a priest. Um, second, he has a criminal record. He, uh, even though he was uh, you know, political, po politically savvy, um, he was arrested briefly for disloyalty during the terror. Um, and third, in calculating the chance that a criminal defendant was wrongly convicted, uh, Laplace in his treatise somewhat generously set the prior odds of guilt at 50-50, uh, which any defense attorney would be proud of, uh, and the chance of wrongful conviction at 25%, and that led him to advocate against the death penalty for the rest of his life. Um, and clearly, he has a special place in Sandy's heart as well. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes uh, talking about the more controversial part of Sandy's talk, which is uh, the case study um, that he uses to look at how this history uh, might be manifest in the fingerprint versus DNA and forensic science, um, uh, and then offer some additional thoughts on how the project fits into the modern trial by mathematics debate. So as, as I see it, Sandy's first um, somewhat controversial claim is that the failure of the field of latent print examination, uh, the failure to develop variability data, is, um, shouldn't surprise us. It's a natural outgrowth of um, Starkey's position that we shouldn't be in the business of overtly quantifying the probative value of evidence. And the first question I'd have for Sandy on this point is what he believes the precise problem to be and how we should fix it. Um, and so is the problem with fingerprinting claims really that they are qualitative rather than quantitative, or is it simply that they are overstated because the claims of source attribution and fingerprints in particular are based on insufficient data? Um, because if it's the latter, if it's really about inaccuracy and not lack of quantification, then it seems the answer could be much simpler than forcing the forensic community to develop population data for fingerprints. Um, I mean, even Starkey acknowledged that when the numbers get big enough, you can declare uniqueness. So the two halves of the torn cloth example, um, in my mind, is exactly the same as the coins in the pocket of the robber example. It's just a matter of degree. Uh, you just, it's, it's the same, it's pattern. Uh, there's a little cut here, there's a cut there. Um, it's just that the numbers are so big that Starkey declares uniqueness at some point and says that that's okay. So why not just increase the minimum number of points that the FBI looks at before they declare a match? That would solve the problem without going to quantification. Um, the problem in Brandon Mayfield's case was that the FBI through sheer incompetence or motivated cognition or whatnot, um, actually made several mistakes in declaring certain matches at those points um, that the Spanish authorities disagreed with. Um, you could also limit experts to making less definitive qualitative statements. So we do this in other forensic fields like facial recognition, which Sandy mentioned. The scientific working group on um, facial recognition technology came up with these qualitative scales uh, they go from, you know, the defendant is most likely to be the source uh, to possibly the source and, and so on. Um, or as some courts have ruled after the National Academy of Sciences report came out in 2009, you could limit the testimony of fingerprint examiners and force them to only say, perhaps they wouldn't say they're 95% sure, but they would say um, to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty rather than claiming zero error rate and individualization. Um, so alternatively, though, if the problem as Sandy sees it is not simply that these fingerprint examiners are overstating the evidence, but they, there's actually something that quantification adds because of the precision aspect, then my question would be, how far does that logic extend to other types of evidence? And Sandy himself alluded to this in his talk. Um, one question would be, would qualitative lay assessments like, uh, that man has the same tattoo the same Pierre Laplace tattoo as the guy who robbed me, um, would that be inadmissible without population data as to, um, as, to how, uh, um, uh, as to how rare the tattoo is in the population? Um, and with respect to the reference class problem that he mentioned, would we allow experts to rattle off statistics even in fields where there are conspicuous reference class problems, such as the number of confessions that are likely to be false, eyewitness identifications that are likely to be erroneous, the number of uh, rape accusations by 15-year-old uh, girls that are false, um, et cetera. 
So I think one answer that Sandy might give uh, to those questions is that quantification of probative value of evidence is particular, the, however you see it in general with respect to evidence in criminal trials, is particularly important in a field like fingerprints where the lack of quantification uh, carries a significant risk of misleading the fact finder for a few reasons. So first, unlike the rare tattoo, lay jurors have no intuition about the frequency in the population of friction ridge details, um, uh, like whirls and loops. And the same goes for tool marks and teeth marks and all of these other uh, questionable forensic sciences that the National Academy has um, indicted recently. Second, friction ridge patterns are rare enough that most experts will have only seen them once. And so they'll assume, wrongly, uh, source attribution if they're basing it solely on qualitative assessments. Um, that's also perhaps what happened in the Brandon Mayfield affair. Uh, but that's not a new argument. Um, and uh, Finkelstein and Fairley made it back in 1970 in their seminal article that led to Lawrence Tribe's seminal trial by mathematics article the same year. And they made it with respect to palm prints. Um, another version of this argument is actually uh, from Maimonides in the 12th century, uh, uh, in a passage actually cited by Judge Weinstein in Fatico, when uh, he argued that qualitative assessments uh, that are less than absolute certainty have no place in legal judgments. Uh, so here's a quick quote. For among contingent things, some are very likely, other possibilities are very remote, and yet others are intermediate. The possible is very wide. Had the Torah permitted punishment to be carried out when the possibility is very likely, uh, even such that it's almost a necessity, some might inflict punishment when the chances are somewhat more distant than that. So if we allow qualitative assessments, then it'll be abused. And people will convict based on uh, much less than highly probable evidence. Um, so we got to stick with the numbers. Um, or in Maimonides' view, perhaps not at all. Um, uh, so the second question I'd have for Sandy on this point is what he believes is the precise contribution of the French and English scholars of the 18th and 19th centuries to these questions. So in other words, how is this discourse enhanced? How are the Brandon Mayfields of the world better protected by our newfound ability to reference uh, not merely the arguments of Finkelstein and Fairley and Maimonides and Tribe and Nesson, but the arguments of Laplace, Bentham, and Starkey as well? So Sandy's second controversial claim uh, is that forensic DNA practice rooted in population statistics that provide a firm scientific basis for that testimony is the way to go. It's this direction in which forensic science should be taken and should be heading in. And from 30,000 feet, that claim seems pretty uncontroversial. Uh, and the recent move towards quantification of the value of non-DNA identification evidence uh, by scientists at the University of Buffalo, among other things, um, are further proof that this position has gained plenty of traction. But I want to suggest briefly uh, that there are dangers lurking on the ground in the quest for precise quantification of, uh, of uncertainty, and dangers that the DNA example itself uh, reveals. So I think these challenges are surmountable, and I'm squarely on the pro-quant side of things, just to be clear, but I think they need to be addressed, and I think they make Starkey's arguments against quantification seem like something of a straw man. So the first danger is that the desire for quantification will push the limits of what is a meaningful and accurate assessment of uncertainty based either on error or coincidence. So uh, the Chicago, someone in the Chicago school um, uh, famously said, if you can't measure it, measure it anyway. Uh, and so let me give you three examples of that. Um, the first is in not nuclear DNA, which is what Sandy uh, focused on, but mitochondrial DNA and YSTR typing, where they're still using something called the counting method, where they basically have this database um, that does not take into account population substructure um, uh, uh, in a coherent way, um, and uses a counting method, just counts how many people in this database of, uh, you know, uh, 11 Egyptians, I think there are 11 people in the Egyptian database last time I checked, uh, how many times you see the defendant's profile, and if you don't see it at all, the answer is zero, and then you just stick a confidence interval around that. And so yes, that pro provides you a number, that gives you quantification, but it's somewhat of a false precision. And I think a qualitative assessment would probably even be more accurate if we're trying to explain the probative value of the match to the jury. Either that or should, it should just be inadmissible entirely. Um, 
The, R, the random match probability is used in nuclear DNA. Um, uh, Bill Thompson's colleague, or in the broader sense, uh, colleague Larry Moeller at Irvine, has published a paper saying that even these random match probabilities may not be accurate, uh, given the number of profile matches that we have seen in some state offender databases, uh, even at 10 or 11 uh, locations, people who match at all of those locations. And that even though we would expect to see those matches, we see them at a number, a high enough number, that it suggests that perhaps the random match probabilities reported by the FBI are not sufficiently taking account of population substructure or lack of independence between the loci. So, uh, um, uh, and to be clear, a Brandon Mayfield can happen in the DNA world. So Bill Thompson has cataloged several false cold hits that have happened um, from cold hit DNA cases from DNA databases. Uh, so the second danger is that the jury will misunderstand the numbers in a way that they wouldn't have misunderstood a more qualitative assessment of probative value. So one issue, of course, is the fallacy of the transposed conditional, also known in the criminal world as the, the prosecutor's fallacy, which equates the random match probability with the probability that the defendant is not the source. Um, and so in previous work, uh, I've shown that every appellate court in the United States to address the issue of whether DNA evidence alone can be sufficient uh, evidence of guilt uh, has engaged in this fallacy, uh, which is a little scary. Um, this isn't an issue, of course, where the random match probability is very, very small. Uh, but um, you know, the FBI's source attribution threshold is a random match probability of one in 300 um, billion. But it's become more relevant with no copy number, degraded samples, mixtures, um, et cetera. Um, now, Bayesian reasoning can perhaps overcome this, but courts are loath to engage in it outside the paternity context, um, at least in the US and now even the UK. Uh, what would Laplace say? Uh, Laplace became a frequentist, apparently, when he was 62. I don't know what happened that year. Um, but, uh, but what would Starkey say? What would Zabel say about giving jurors a chart of possible prior probabilities? Um, Tribe says that, uh, Lawrence Tribe said that, that this would be a problem because it would violate the presumption of innocence. Uh, it's dehumanizing, it dwarfs soft variables. If we wanted to go to quantification in all of these types of evidence, we would have to deal with those critiques. And I wonder what um, Sandy's position is. Um, in my mind, it seems at the very least that criminal defendants should be able to use it as evidence of innocence and would have a intellectual due process right to Bayesian reasoning in front of the jury if it could show the jury why somebody is not guilty. Um, OK. so. I think I have a couple of minutes left, perhaps. OK, so um, some additional thoughts on the relevance of Sandy's work to the trial by mathematics discourse, all, or alternative title to this one minute subheading. Um, things I'd like to ask these 19th century guys over dinner tonight if they came. Uh, so the first is about why Starkey cares about the uncertainty inherent in finding the suspect guilty of robbery uh, uh, based solely on the coins in his pocket. So Edward Chang um, Itali and Talia Fisher and others have suggested that the best explanation for why people have this aversion to convictions based solely on naked statistical evidence is uh, not just that it's simply numer starkly numerical proof, but that it, it's, there's a type of proof um, that is not, quote, sensitive meaning that uh, the probability of seeing the evidence given the hypothesis that the defendant is innocent is exactly the same as the probability of seeing the evidence given the counterfactual. So, uh, um, or at least that's how sensitivity was uh, uh, described to me. So uh, please feel free to um, explain how that's different. But in their mind, this is how you would explain why the blue bus hypothetical and the gate crasher hypothetical um, are problematic, but DNA cold hits are not. Or so, it, in a recent paper, this is how this was explained to me. So, um, so I wonder how Sandy feels about the blue bus hypothetical. And I also think it's interesting because Starkey is an interesting counterexample to this. Um, the coin in the pocket, pocket hypothetical is a hypothetical used by an anti-quantification person where the evidence is, does seem to be sensitive to guilt or innocence. Um, so I'll stop there because I'm out of time. But, uh, and I'll ask my other questions in the Q&A over dinner. Thank you. So clearly, Sandy has the first word, right? If you want it. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I guess uh, I'll be interested to hear other comments, so I'll, I'll limit myself. Um, 
I do agree that there is a, this, uh, an issue of inaccuracy versus quantification. And so I think, uh, obviously, and those are really two different things. And so one thing is it's important to have some sense of how accurate or inaccurate uh, a system is. Uh, and there's a difference between that and simply the, the dangers when you, you quantify. But one of, uh, if I was to flesh out my argument more, I'd say one of the problems is that in some ultimate sense, all proof is probabilistic. And if you liked really the um, subtext of my argument was that I saw Sarkey as essentially winning this debate at the time. But I think the problem there is you have a pretense that as long as I can quantify things, uh, I'm in an insufficiently strong uh, state of belief. But I can then reach some non-quantifiable state, which is extremely strong and adequate. And I think the problem there is that it then puts a certain amount of pressure on the system to deprecate the uncertainties. And so this 100% certain match that the FBI put forward, was that wasn't just a, an off-the-record uh, comment. This was something that was put into an affidavit. And that's really the, the pressure on the, on the profession in that environment, is to pretend somehow not that it's extremely likely that this is the person, but it's 100% match, and there's only one person who can have this fingerprint. And if we can't say that, then we should certainly say, unless we exclude him, we should just say it's inconclusive. And I think that's an unrealistic kind of uh, exemplar to have, uh, this idea that it's all or nothing. And so I'm saying I think that's the, the trouble is that that polar position then drives out um, more nuanced uh, uh, views. And I do think my memory is from Tribe's article is that there's also a, a he has at some point basically a, a social policy issue, which is we don't want to have people think that we have an insensitive system where we're willing to convict people on something other, less, other than really compelling grounds. And my memory is that he argues there that we shouldn't allow these kinds of probabilistic assessments in because then a jury is saying, well, I think it's 99% certain that he's guilty. And Tribe would argue, but we don't want juries and the public to think it's possible that someone who's only 99% likely is convicted. But the trouble is that it then really, but that's always the case. I, I don't think it's, it's a, a realistic uh, type of situation. Uh, I think uh, finally, you know, there is an issue of, uh, I think, um, objective uh, quantification and, and uh, objective review, uh, uh, statements. Um, I think what you, to me, the really sobering aspect of Mayfield is the following. You have the initial person in the lab, the examiner says, this is a 100% match. His section chief signs on and says it's 100%. They get someone out of retirement who says it's 100, who says maybe not 100%, but agrees that it's a match. And you had a retired member of the profession who signs on. And in a certain, but there's no, See, in DNA, if there's an argument as to the, the uh, match and the quality of the match and so on, it's actually possible to show the electropharograms and to discuss the basis of the numbers and what assumptions are being made. And it's possible to review an objective record and say, here, we're, we isolate where we're disagreeing. Whereas in the fingerprint uh, issue, it's really, uh, in rea the, the reality is, it's mostly just what I, you might call, trust me, forensic science which is that you have an expert who comes in, makes an opinion, and it's very difficult if there aren't uh, objectively identifiable elements to it, it's very difficult then to attack it. And so typically, fingerprint evidence has been almost never successfully attacked in court. And so I think part of the objectification is that it makes the basis of the expert's opinion clearer. And I think that's helpful both in terms of a certain humility on the part of the expert, because he knows someone else will be reviewing it. And it also makes it possible then to more seriously discuss just the strength of the evidence. And I think that's my major objection to subjective types of, uh, so, uh, uh, forensic science, is that you have something where basically someone's just saying, it's almost like an art expert. And that's actually a, a, an analogy that's been used in one decision is that someone saying, I'm an expert on Rembrandt, and to me, this is a Rembrandt. 
And if we heard that testimony, we'd say, okay, we understand that, but if someone who's a, not an ex another expert might come to a different opinion. But instead, these are opinions that are being put forward to science, and yet somehow the factual basis that you would ordinarily um, attribute to science is missing. So to me, that's a, so I'm making this argument, but it's really in the, in the fairly narrow context of forensic science, and the bottom line is simply saying, I think DNA represents a healthy trend away from subjective assessment. So I see a few hands, and we have a couple of minutes left for the rest of the audience. So I guess I have two points. One, in terms of process failure, I mean, part of what went on with Mayfield was this guy was a civil rights attorney. And, you know, you wouldn't have ever gotten those four tests um, if this hadn't been somewhere where they look at, oh, my gosh, this guy works with Arabs, you know. So the probability is not just the probability, even if we could assign one to fingerprints, um, it's the probability of the whole process getting to court in a certain way or getting in front of somebody who can take you to jail. Um, you know, the other thing is just the obvious, I mean, it would be very easy to quantify the accuracy of fingerprint experts, and they have fought for decades against that. You could, you know, it would be very easy to give somebody 100, 100 examples and see how often they get them right. Uh, and, and, and there's been absolute pushback against that. You know, we, we wouldn't let any machine make decisions without quantifying it, and somehow we let people do that. Can I inject a respectful dissent at the beginning of the day that um, all proof is probabilistic? Um, what we're talking about here is not whether there is uncertainty. I mean, if what you mean by prob prob probabilism or prob probability is uncertainty, yes, that's true. But that's not really what we're talking about. There's semantic ambiguity, the forms of uncertainty. It's sort of pointless to try to reduce that to, to the kinds of technical techniques that we're talking about with respect to probability theory. There's ignorance, again, it's kind of pointless. More importantly, the kinds of tools that we're talking about don't map on to the typical problem. Viewing the legal system through the lens of DNA and fingerprints is viewing it through the lens of things that are reducible to relative frequencies. That is not the standard problem in the law. The standard problem in the law involves judgments of what I call plausibility. There are lots of other uh, intellectual techniques, cognitive tools besides probabilistic uh, 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 accounts or methodologies, like, for example, coherence, consistency, economy, efficiency, all the things that the mind operates on. So I just want to in inject at the beginning of the day a descent to the hegemonic notion that all things are probabilistic, and therefore, probability theory is explanatory, generally explanatory, uh, a useful paradigm for all forms of proof. These are idiosyncratic in the legal system they're not the general problem that the legal system deals with. And final comment or question for you. Um, thank you. So I'm a practitioner, so this is a practical question. I'm, I'm actually a forensic scientist, DNA in particular. So for both um, Sandy um, uh, and um, uh, Ms. Roth, um, Sandy, in your slide about Dumont, you talked uh, about people's different perceptions of numerical uh, scales of uncertainty. And as the field moves towards likelihood ratios and presenting very sophisticated techniques uh, in, in court, we uh, struggle with how to present these things. And one of the things we discuss, especially when we uh, teach, is this verbal scale, and it's been introduced a number of times, and in fact, it, the numbers have changed as, as people have introduced it. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't mind asking both of you just to comment on a practical application of a verbal scale that would represent uncertainty, like for likelihood ratios, and is that some way to present it in court? Is that completely misleading? Um, I'd like to hear your comments. Yes. Um, you don't mean just a chart of prior probabilities and a, you mean? No, not the priors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I, I'm going to defer to, uh, to Sandy, and probably Bill's paper probably speaks to this a little bit. But um, I mean, I've, I've seen papers on how jurors deal with likelihood ratios versus uh, frequency statistics. Um, but I, uh, I think that's a question for, for the jurors and psychologist uh, studies people. Uh, I have no easy answer to that question. So I've done a, a moderate amount of testifying over the years uh, in, among other things, DNA cases. And I think the, so my talk was somewhat theoretical, but in terms of the practicalities of courtroom presentation, I think it's an extremely uh, difficult question. Uh, it's jurors and judges typically find it very hard to understand what the numbers actually mean. Uh, sometimes people argue between likelihood ratios and so-called random man not excluded statistics. And although one might be viewed as theoretically superior, uh, one reason I'm somewhat sympathetic to the other is simply because I think it's easier to explain what's going on. So I think, and then when you get into issues of database searches and so on, it's, I think in general it's a very difficult question how you successfully communicate quantitative information in a case where it actually matters. Okay, so a lot of the cases it doesn't, so anything goes, but I'm saying if it really matters that the trier fact really understands the meaning of the number, I think it's an extremely difficult, challenging problem. And that's, I found, you know, throughout my entire career when I've done um, testifying, that's always a, an issue. You know, and you can certainly, I, you know, I've been in a hearing where the prosecution experts talks for several hours, I talk for at least a couple of hours on, on direct and cross, and then it's clear from the very first question, I actually remember this vividly in the case, the very first question the judge asks, and it's clear he hasn't followed anything of what's happened last four hours on either side. And it's just, I and he was a you know, bright guy, but it's just he wasn't a math, math person. 